uh, on behalf of the Blackjack 2020, we want to give you a warm welcome. My name is Matias Marin, Director for International Station at Universidad Católica de Manizales. Uh, we want to remind our participants to please turn off your microphones during the session. Uh, for any inquiry or question related to our theme presented in this scenario, we kindly ask you to type them in our chat or Q&A tool or to follow the orientations of our moderator, uh, Stephanie Dasher. We encourage you to be attentive to the announcements and community forums published in our Cuba app in order to motivate dialogues and discussion among all of us. We would also like to invite you to visit our exhibitors virtual stands where you will be able to interact with over 15 institutions, including our diamond, gold and silver sponsors. Uh, we welcome you all on board and Stephanie, the floor is yours. I will unmute myself. Thank you, Matias. Gracias. Uh, hola a todo el mundo. So good to see you. I'm so happy to be here. I want to thank everyone at LaCheck. I've been having an amazing day and it started with the opening uh, plenary discussion about global citizenship. My mind was, was exploding. My heart was growing because I thought what a perfect introduction to what we're going to be talking about and thinking about together today. I have planned a very active session. And so we are going to use all of the tools, all of the toys of Zoom. And uh, we're going to start playing those right now, playing with those right now. I will uh, be asking for five fantastic volunteers to participate in a global learning experience today. So start thinking about if you would like to be one of those volunteers. I promise I'll make it easy for you to do a great job and to look fabulous. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. All right, so today we are going to uh, focus on three very important terms and concepts. And I am going to first ask you if you, uh, if you have not had a chance to rename yourself, you might want to go down to the bottom of the screen where it says participants and make sure that you have put your name there, but also your institution. I put Florida International University, which is FIU. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me and FIU in just a minute, but I hope that there will be connections made in this session and it will help people to know who's here and where you're from. Okay, and the next thing I want to do is make sure that we all know how to use the chat. Um, the chat is where we're going to spend some time brainstorming. So if we could experiment right now, could you write down right now in the chat you're going to find that spot on the bar below and write your city or your country that you're in exactamente <laughs> thank you vanessa she wrote that she's in bogota and believer is a song that she thinks represents where she lives this is great i see people are using the chat excellent and I have a feeling that there will be ideas in the chat, like the songs that you recommend to each other. And you might want to save the chat and everybody can do that. So if you go to the chat window and you see the three dots, the very first thing you can choose is, is to save the chat. So if there are ideas today, it will download onto your computer. All right, great. I'm so glad to see everybody getting excited. And I hope you'll start recommending some songs because I want some new ones before we leave today. And then also, you should be able to do the raise hand feature. And this will help us to be able to see you that you would like to um, turn off your mute, you would like to unmute, that is, and contribute to the dialogue, especially um, when we have our volunteers participating because 
our volunteers may want to ask for some help from the audience and you could help by using the chat or you could help by speaking. Okay, uh, does anyone want to raise their hand right now and do you have any questions about what we're going to do so far? About how to use any of the tools? Yeah, okay. Vanessa, is your hand. Oh, okay, let me see. Go ahead, Vanessa, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. I just want to say that this activity is really fantastic. It's a good way to, to start the, uh, the activity, learning how to use the platform. So thank you so much for this activity. I really like it. You're welcome. And I'll be happy to share with you these slides so that you can use them in your presentations or at work anytime you like and share them with, with other faculty. I got them from someone, so I will share them with you. Okay. Now let's get started with what we're going to be talking about today. So, and thinking about. Oh, I forgot to also mention, you can see the speaker view or the gallery view in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you just want to see the person speaking or if you want to see everybody, you can choose the view that you like. Okay, our agenda today. We're going to begin with this idea of what is global learning. And then we're going to build on it another layer of complexity. What is the relationship between global learning and global citizenship? And finally, one more layer of complexity. What is the relationship between global learning, global citizenship, and the internationalization of our institutions and of higher education in our country and in our region. So I think I might have been asked to come today by Matias because I happen to be a leader of a program called Global Learning for Global Citizenship at Florida International University in Miami. And if you don't know anything about uh, FIU, we have 58,000 students. We are one of the largest universities in the United States. About 38,000 of our students are undergraduates. And we are a public university. We are a research university. But we are a university that is an anchor of our local community and we feel that we are a globally engaged university because we reside in a global crossro crossroads and you can tell that by just walking around our campus and my heart cracks a little bit when i think about the fact that we're all so separated right now but anytime you go into a zoom room for our classroom you will see and you will hear a whole world of complexions, of races, ethnicities, languages, cultures. About 70% of our students are Latin American Hispanic. So we have a very close relationship with Latin America. And as part of our initiative, every one of our 38,000 undergraduate students takes at least two global learning designated courses before they graduate. And they also integrate activities that are co-curricular on campus, in the community, around the country, and abroad. So as Ann Mason was saying this morning, if you had the, if you were lucky to be in that opening plenary, it was so good. She said, it's really important to define terms. We spent a year and a half at the university trying to decide what does it mean for us global learning and global citizenship and so today I'm going to share with you more about that and we do have a book and we're on the verge of finding a publisher for a Spanish edition called making global learning universal it tells you everything that I know <laughs> about global learning and how we made sure that all of our students engage in it at, at FIU. And there are also 
uh, models that you can apply in your institutions. And we have a podcast. The third season will be devoted completely to intercambios virtuales, totally to COIL. These are stories of how faculty in different disciplines infuse global learning in their courses. So now let's really get into it. I want to ask you a question. When you think of global learning, which word comes to mind for you? Unity or diversity? When you think of that word, and you should see a poll in front of you right now. There we go. Oh, I, I see that they asked all three questions. Uh, we have all three questions in the poll. <laughs> but really, that's okay. We'll, we'll launch it again. Let's see what people are thinking about when you think about the first question. Unity or diversity? Actually, you can answer all three questions. We'll just sh share the, the results later. I'll keep these. Okay, it looks like so far about eight people have answered the first question. Oh, a lot of people are thinking about diversity. More so than the concept of unity. This is very interesting to me. And when we think about global citizenship, we're thinking about the term in terms of education, but also maybe about birth, that the idea that we're born global citizens. And finally, okay, here we have in this question about internationalization, which word do we think more about if it's something that we do inward, an inward focus or an outward focus? There's some people that are thinking about the inward and the outward. Okay, this is great. So we'll be thinking, oh yes, we have someone who thinks about the word unity. This is good. We only need one person to think a little bit differently. Okay, I'm, I'm going to end the poll for just a moment here, and I'll share the results with you. There we go. And I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and I want to ask if it's possible for the person who thought more about unity to share why they thought that. If you would be willing to explain why you thought, either in the chat, oh, I see someone is saying, couldn't it be both words, unity and diversity? Is there anyone who would like to share their thoughts about this question? We'd love to hear from you. Maria Carolina Serrano is raising her hand. Oh, perfecto. I'm going back and forth through the screen to see where a hand raises. Maria Carolina, what, what were you thinking? Hi, Stephanie. Well, I, I, I doubt it a little bit. I mean, I, I, I put diversity on the, on the poll, but then I thought at the end, I think we all need to have like a common uh, meaning of what humanity is and, and the, the, the core uh, goals that we all have as a, as a society. So mm -hmm. I think in, in certain points, we, are, we all have to have some unity in terms of what we're all looking for as, mm -hmm. as humankind. Mm -hmm. That was something that um, was brought up in the conversation this morning, uh, that perhaps there is a core, uh, there are core values, the idea of values and global citizenship was brought up even though there might be, as one of the speakers said, different ways of enacting those core values, are there some, some, some things that we do have in common? Some of uh, Vanessa has written, global citizenship turns into a diverse unity. This is a really very interesting. So you, I would like to share with you um, this a little bit about this idea of diversity and unity. This is the first image of the planet Earth that that was beamed down to us from space in 1969. And it was the first time that we had a chance to see our entire globe as a big blue marble. There was a sense of seeing the world for the first time as a borderless place. 
Because when we look at it from space, from very far away, the borders between our countries, our cultures, our languages, the borders between, the, between space and the sea and the land seem to meld together. The border between humanity and the environment. And this, this image in 1969 coincided with the very first time that the term global learning was created. It was the name of one of the sections of the United Nations University, which still exists. And that section was devoted to determining what are the problems that the whole planet face that we must contribute to solving. That's the global part. And then there was the learning part. What kind of education do we need to provide to people, to citizens, in order to help them understand and address those problems? Now, this is a beautiful view of the earth, but it's not very useful to us sometimes. If we're trying to sail or fly from one country to another, we can't really use this image of the, of the planet. And the planet is a three-dimensional sphere, and this is a two-dimensional image. There is a whole part of the planet, a huge portion of the planet that we can't see right now with this image. So we try to create maps. But again, this is a problem because every map of the world that we create Every map that has a certain purpose gives up accuracy for some details in order to maintain accuracy for others. The map that is all the way up in the upper right, that is the, the, uh, that's the map that we're used to seeing. That is the Mercator pro projection and it's created so that people could sail from one country to another and not get lost. But the problem is that the sizes of the continents are completely wrong. Africa looks much smaller than Greenland and Greenland is, and Africa is so much bigger than Greenland. And these other projections were all cre created for different purposes, but none of them are completely right. Each one, each diverse map, holds a piece of the puzzle. So, so far in thinking about global learning, we've been thinking about the fact that it's a little bit about diversity and it's a little bit about unity. It has something to do with problems. It has something to do with perspective, but that doesn't really tell us how to design global learning. It doesn't tell us as professors, what should I be having my students do in my class to engage in global learning? What kind of learning outcomes should I be directing them towards? What kind of readings, what kind of activities? How do I, how do I assess global learning? And I have found that the best way to understand what global learning is, is to actually participate in it. So today, I'm going to lead us in a global learning activity. And I'm not going to share with you what our definition of global learning is until after we do the activity. So first we'll do the activity, and then I will show the definition and then you will get to interrogate what just happened. Was it a global learning experience or was it not a global learning experience? And then we will start thinking about how that applies to our work in our colleges, our universities, and our other types of institutions. So we're going to stick with this idea of a map because it's a very, very rich metaphor for thinking about global learning we're going to create a consequences map. Now, this is an activity that any professor could do in any class, but you could also do it as a leader in your institution. 
anytime you have a question that's complicated or uh, a problem of some type and you want to do exactly what we were talking about maintain the diversity of the perspectives but also bring them together as vanessa was saying to understand and address a common issue so we're going to do this consequences map and you can have a problem that is a local problem to do this global learning activity, something that affects you in your direct neighborhood, or it could be a problem that's very, very far away. And today we're going to do something that's a little bit both because we're going to use the technology. We're going to explore a problem that for me is very, very local. It's immediate. It's going to impact me, but for you, it will be something that's very, very far away. The question is, is it a good global learning problem and how do we, how do we examine it together? So here's the situation, the scenario, the what if at the center of our map. What if I wake up tomorrow morning and I step out of my bed and splash I look down and I'm standing in two feet of water. And I look out my window and as far as the eye can see, two feet of water. Where I live in Miami, very near to the coast, completely inundated, flooded, sea level rise has happened overnight. It was predicted it happened overnight. That would have a big impact on me. <laughs> that, I think about the fact that the electrical outlets are below two feet. So my electricity is probably going to be out. And I'm wondering, how am I going to, what's, what's my transport? How am I going to get anywhere? Because my car is flooded and I have medicines that I needed and I only have two, two days of those left. So clearly this issue is a problem for me, but is it a, a global problem? So now we're going to move to the next stage. Let's start thinking about this problem, not from my perspective of Stephanie in Miami, but from other people's perspectives. And for this activity, I need five volunteers. I need five people to turn on their video. If you would feel comfortable doing that, that would be amazing. And also to unmute. So let's see if we have some hands. I need five people to be part of this activity. Yeah, Mary Hayes. Uh, Fabulous. Yay. Okay. Great, Mary. And who else? Let's see. Nobody else. Come on. Oh, no, I know we're going to get some people. And I'm going to hey, show you. Vanessa. All right, I'm going to show you a cool thing. We're even going to create a fishbowl effect. Okay. So we have Mary and who else is there? Because I don't see your name. Vanessa Vargas. Ah, Vanessa, excellent. Okay, we have Mary, we have Vanessa. Who's gonna play with us? Who else is gonna play? Matias, you could play with us. You could do this too. <laughs> and I think Maria Carolina, I think we definitely need Maria Carolina to do it. Valencia is there as well. Okay, fabulous. I'm okay. here, I'm here. Terrific. So now, um, you know, I'm not sure if we can do the fishbowl effect, but if you go down to where it says participants, if you're, and you click and you see, hide non-video people, then you should only be able to see six people right, me, right now. If you hide non-video, do you have that function? No. Maybe not, maybe not. Well, yeah. it's, a very cool, yeah. it's a very cool thing. You can make a fishbowl. Hacen clic derecho sobre, las sobre alguna de las imágenes y ahí les dice que ocultar los que no tienen video. 
Perfecto. Oh, exactly. Go. Good. So now you should see just the six of us. So this is a fishbowl effect. So far we've used the poles. This is the fishbowl effect. So these are all sorts of things that we can do to do use to, to do global learning online. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share yet another tool that we're going to use together. Okay, here is our map, our consequences map. And this is using the AW uh, app. Can everybody see this colorful map? Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Okay, we are going to now step out of our perspectives as leaders of internationalization in Latin America. Wherever you are, whatever you do, you're going to take on now a different role, a different perspective to engage in this activity, okay? And I'm going to assign you that role. And when I do, I'm going to ask you to do some thinking. I want you to do the same type of thinking that I just did. I was thinking about if sea level rise happened in Miami, what kind of direct impacts would that have on my life? And you can see I've already put some down here in my brainstorm. I said, well, I would need transportation. I would need access to medicines. I would need, I didn't say, but I do need clean water to drink because the water is contaminated. I need to find electricity so I can communicate. But now we're going to think from some different perspectives. Mary, I would like you to imagine that you are an environmental scientist. Okay. But you live in Shanghai. Okay. Okay, which is on the coast of China. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to think a little bit. You don't have to say anything yet. What impacts might and I see you might be going to write them down. What impacts might, that's good, you get an A. <laughs> <laughs> what impacts might sea level rise in Miami have on you in your role or in your life as an environmental scientist all the way in Shanghai, China? Okay, so I want you to think about that and brainstorm a little bit and I'll come back to you in a minute. All right, okay. Bye. Vanessa, brave Vanessa. You are someone totally different. You are the president of Carnival Cruise Lines. We love having a woman CEO. The global cruise line, I don't know if you've ever been to Miami, but the offices of Carnival are a little far away from the port, but the, all those ships are right there in the port of Miami and there's the visitor center to take in, this beautiful new visitor center to take in tourists from all over the world who fly into Miami International Airport and they're taking a vacation of a lifetime. I want you to think about as the president of Carnival Cruise Lines, how would sea level rise impact you? What would be the first things that you would be thinking about? Okay, do some thinking. Now, Sandra, totally different perspective. You are a refugee, recently arrived in Miami from Venezuela. Let's say that you're not even mastered, you haven't even mastered English yet. You do not have a job. I want you to think, how would sea level rise be impacting you? You've been in Miami for a couple of months what would this, what would be the first things that would come to mind for what you would need to do? Okay, Maria Carolina, you are an architect. <laughs> you are in Amsterdam. I have a feeling you probably know a little bit about Amsterdam. <laughs> and Matias, the UN Secretary General. <laughs> Global learning started with the United Nations. And I'm wondering, 
from your perspective as the UN Secretary General, and you know that you can decide where in the world you're from and where you're located. Uh, you're, you know, we know that the UN is is located in 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 the main offices in New York, but you could be anywhere. What? How would this impact you? What would you be thinking about? Okay. All right. Now. This is also, this. we're gonna do this like, uh, I think it's called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? If for some reason you, you, you need some help, you can ask for a lifeline and we can get some ideas from the people in the audience if you don't have four ideas of impacts. But what we wanna do is get some sense of how this is impacting you. I'm sorry, I have a question. I'm a refugee. Am I alone or am I with my family? You get to decide. Okay, thank you. Okay, I want you to use your imagination, your empathetic imagination. And also, you just got extra credit. I forgot to mention, if you have questions about anything, you get extra credit for questions, all right? Mm. So if you are wondering, um, you know, are there, uh, where, what, who's supporting refugees in the city of Miami? If you're wondering, um, are there free, uh, are there, there, do homeless shelters accept foreign nationals? Any question that you have, you get extra credit for thinking of those. We like questions, okay? All right. I have a question. Yes, good. Can I, can I, um contact my 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 fellow uh participants or or colleagues you know can i contact the u.n secretary general can i contact okay. them i mean not I yet okay but we'll be able to okay you will be able to not yet that's the second part okay okay okay. <laughs> okay so first first Let's take, let's take, spend some time with our um, environmental scientists in Shanghai. It's nice to meet you. We're glad that you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what thoughts do you have, Mary, about how this word, or, or I don't know, I usually ask people to come up with names. I forgot to do that part too. Everything's different it's when okay. you're online. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this activity about 150 times, <laughs> but it's all different online. Okay, my dear. <laughs> How would this impact you? Well, I I came up with three thoughts. Um, one, perhaps a little more, um, it, it more of a reaction and kind of an immediate reaction is a little bit of fear. Is if I'm on a coastal city myself, um, it's only a matter of time before this happens to me, to my family, to my colleagues, to my friends etc. Um, then <laughs> sort of a little bit of gloating. Yeah. Like I knew it. We've been saying this for years <laughs> and um, you know, unfortunately it's, 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 uh, it's had to come to this, but now people are going to start to take this seriously mm -hmm. when we're saying that climate change is real and that it's going to affect us and that it's going to affect us in our lifetime. All right. And then um, the sense of, after processing those two, <laughs> those two more like, uh, not necessarily positive thoughts, but um, an opportunity, an opportunity to take what's happening in Miami to, to, to go and study um, the effect that this sea level rise is going to have on human population, on plant population, on animal population, because again, it's only a matter of time that this happens again on other, in other coastal areas and coastal cities, and it could help us be better prepared. And I already have an idea of okay. some, okay. Of, my some okay. of my participants okay. here who are the help I'm going to need. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So, so let's think of, see if we can come up with one more. I want to ask you, like, if this is an opportunity to study what is maybe the next, this is almost like a secondary effect. It should probably be something that's coming off of this one. But if you want to study, what else are you going to need to do the studying? I'm going to need to reach out to um, not only people in my field, mm -hmm. but probably people in other fields, people in the private sector, people in 
government uh, because in order to get to this studying, um, maybe Miami's roped off now, so I can't physically go to Miami uh, to, to get in field, but perhaps a colleague at a, a local university can do that. We okay. might need permission from, um, so I'm going to have to, yeah, I'm going to have to open up my contact list and start getting in touch with people and maybe reaching out to new people as well. Uh, people who, who weren't necessarily in my contact list. All right. Fabulous. Thank you very much for sharing your perspective, your map on this situation. Okay. Now the president of Carnival Cruise Lines, you probably have a different perspective, a different map <laughs> of what this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it my dear. <laughs> well, actually, the idea that I've got, well, the first one was that my company is going to be affected. Mm -hmm. But I, I have seen it in a different way because I said the industry is going to change because uh, probably I'm going to turn into a C real estate company. So probably I'm going to change my cruise line into like a um, permanent or probably... Um, yeah, like a permanent uh, place to live for my for my, for for my visitors. So I was thinking in in this in this perspective. Okay. So, okay. All right. Very interesting. What, so you had kind of an opportunity, and I didn't say how what the impact had to be positive, negative. I just said what's the impact. Any other impacts that came to mind? It will actually was regarding training because I said I have to train my 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 employees into something uh, related to um, how to how to live for longer time in the sea, how to face like anxiety and this guy different feelings that the that the users of the cruise line is going to be is going to experience during the 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 time that they are going to be in the cruise line. So it was, it was planning in these two sides. Okay. Anything else that you're thinking about? No, no, that was, that was the only uh, two sides that I thought. Do you think that you'll be able, will you have all the money that you need to be able to? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I'm curious if anyone who is, um, observing uh, has any other thoughts about how Carnival Cruise Lines might be impacted with sea level rise. Let's think about where do most of your employees live? In the cruise line. I mean, okay. they are going to live inside the boats. That's why okay. we are going to change like the, like the perspective of the business. So we are not going to be like a, um, a just short term period of inside the, I mean, from the cruise lines, but we are going to be like a permanent real estate company, C okay. real estate company. All right. Excellent. Isabel, you have um, your hand raised. How else do you think? Yes. Thank you. You were asking about another idea, I mean, another thoughts that as as, uh, as Vanessa, as the president of Carnival Cruise Lines, ha yeah. could be could have. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I want to to share maybe the problem of how I'm going now to set sail. You know, maybe because these people uh, they are travelers, I assume, mm -hmm. and they have to get back. They have like a, a schedule their vacation or, or they are staying in 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 Miami. Mm -hmm. So should I have any problem like uh, for set sail for set sail or uh, should I have to prepare to to stay in Miami for longer mm -hmm. and I have to check if I have everything if I'm going to charge for it if I'm going to get the discount for every night or 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 for food or I mean what I'm going to do if I have to stay to to keep the the, the cruises in Miami and mm -hmm. that set sail on on schedule. Okay, so so some logistical issues. Where am exactly. I going to get food? If I'm going to have to change my prices, will where can I set sail? Do I have to prepare to stay in port longer? Fantastic. Thanks for that lifeline. Our Venezuelan refugee, Sandra. What's on your mind? What's happening? Well, actually, I feel really scared about everything. You know. And it's like that moment in which you have no idea about what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I've always thought that when you're afraid, you have two choices. Either you, get, you go crazy or you start thinking about possibilities and options on what to do. Yeah. Because I mean, if I'm a refugee, um, might be, well, I think that I might have traveled to the States because I have my family and I want to just, um, you know, like give them money, you know, because we are having too many issues um, in there. So that might have had the first reason why I went to the States. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about me, but also about my family who's there, who's not only me, the person in trouble right now. Yes. So that like opens a lot the bubble. I have no food, I have no water, I have no clothes, I have no, no, I mean, I don't have anything there. However, I, after you began just like talking and everybody uh, continued speaking, I was wondering also, if I'm, if I already have the name of refugee, it means that somehow I might have some help, some help from the government, I don't know. So oh. here, my questions will be like, what kind of help can I receive? Who I can, who I can contact? Um, same thing. Do I know somebody around in the area who I can call and, you know, like at least have some light about what to do? And maybe if I know other people, they might also be refugees. So I would like to know how they are because if I'm in trouble, they might also be in trouble. And if you are many people like, you know, looking for possibilities, creativity comes up when you talk to different people. And we might have different chances to just, uh, I think, find different solutions, find some help. Because I think that right now we need a lot of help. So I'm, I might be like on that line, thinking about other people who are like in the same situation or people who can help me. And especially that was a question that raised uh, well, well, it was just doing the exercise. Mm -hmm. If I am a refugee, it means that I, I can be helped. So my question is, who can help me in this situation? Yeah, yeah. What kind of help can refugees get during a crisis? Yep. Who helps refugees? This is a question. It's a research question that we have. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective, your map. Mm -hmm. um, our architect in Amsterdam, like a completely different part of the world. How does sea level rise in Miami impact you? Because uh, in Amsterdam, uh, we're experts in uh, flooding mm -hmm. uh, studies. So as an architect, I, um, well, I probably teach at FIU oh. at the Sustainable Cities uh, program. So I would first check on my students and my colleagues and, and if I know somebody there see that that everybody is okay mm -hmm. uh, and see how i can help but since we have an expertise in my country uh in that area the first thing i would or the second thing um, after thinking about the people would be what can we do to mm -hmm. help so mm -hmm. uh, i would probably contact an ngo or probably we have that in 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 the country or in europe uh to help cities uh, or, or countries that suffer from these um, situations and contact authorities in Miami or, or see how the best and fastest way to get in touch with uh, the authorities in Miami to offer um, our services, you know, and, and pack like a, a bunch of volunteers from my colleagues in Amsterdam uh, from different areas to, to see what we can do to help and to give some advice for them on how to get uh, this crisis um, the fastest. Fabulous. Okay. Fabulous. Terrific. And, and I, yeah, if I have some work in Miami, some buildings that I built or some, sorry, ha some houses that I built, yeah. I would probably contact them and see if they are doing okay and see how my work is responding to the water. Oh, hey, okay. Yeah. Fabulous uh, buildings in Miami. Fabulous, fabulous. Okay, our UN Secretary General. Well, I happen to be living in Lisbon and uh, oh. And, and we are sharing and, um, you know, on the other side of the ocean. So I am also wondering uh, whether, because it is, even though it is in, in the other side, I, I want to assess the problem. Mm -hmm. And to assess the problem, I, I call a, a council of advisors from different areas that we have uh, in the United Nations. 
because we want because this event in Miami uh, may be uh, uh, something that needs some humanitarian action. So and our core values, like some of our core values, are you know like human rights and solidarity and um, and and maybe also these things may, may cause some riots or may, may cause some despair from people. And uh, so that's why I want to get together with my with with my advisors and also to get in contact with our with our headquarters in New York, and uh, to assess uh, the the real problem, whether this is actually something that might cause like that may have some bigger effects uh, not only in the ocean but in the region, and uh, and with our volunteers, like what actions we can take because you know like we need to place uh, our values into into action. So we may have some, uh, let's say, campaign action with some governments. We need to contact the, the, the mayor in, in Miami as well and okay. uh, to check what's going on. And uh, let's say that we open this network of support. So different people with our volunteers as well, different people, we open this network so that we can actually assess what's really the issue, what's really the alarm of it, so that we can uh, take action and, uh, but it's not a person's action, but it, it is something that must be, let's say, together. So we need to get to get different people with different, uh, let's say, functions and expertise on board. Okay, there we go. So now we have experienced, we've, we've gotten a sense of the different maps of this same issue, sea level rise in Miami. And many of the effects were kind of negative, their challenges, their problems, we started to have some people thinking in terms of opportunities. Now I'm going to challenge the people who happen to be at the table and even anybody who's in the audience, you can raise your hand and I'll do my best to find you. You can unmute if you need to. I want you to tell me if you see any connections. Okay, right now we're looking for relationships, any kind of relationship, I don't care. Do you see any connections amongst the impacts that sea level rise in Miami is having on these different stakeholders? And when you see them, I'm going to draw them. I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw them in red so that we'll be able to really see them. So anybody see any relationships? I see that a lot of us mentioned um, contacting and, and, and trying to collaborate with people um, outside of our, of maybe what our, our day to day is. Okay. So um, contact NGOs, contact government authorities, contact um, local universities or academics, um, call together a council of advisors, um, sort of this idea that this isn't a, a problem where the solution is going to come from one area. We all need to, to get together. We all need to get humble maybe and understand that um, everybody's going to bring something to the table that, that one, not, no single one of us has the solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some common themes here, the connections amongst the fact that everybody has a piece of the puzzle, that no single group can solve it themselves, we're going to have to collaborate outside of our sector, other connections that you see amongst these different impacts, anything? Emotions. Emotions. So in general, I think that all of us expressed different emotions about it. But most of them were like uh, scared, uh, fear. I mean, like, um, it's like this impact of the of an unexpected uh, reality. Uh -huh. So it's like similar with the situation that we're experiencing now. At the beginning, it was like everyone will, I don't know, like freak out. But later on, it was like just getting like a, a new... <laughs> ordinary way to live so yeah so even the 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 refugee in miami and even the scientist in china are both feeling this this fear even though they're completely disconnected very interesting what other what other connections do you see well i see like like two, two groups 
maybe uh, the ones who have been directly impacted by uh -huh. by the situation and the ones that know about it, maybe because they have already suffered uh, from it or because they just work around the topic and they can do something. You know, right. there are some, some people who need something and some people who can give that uh, advice or resources or, or whatever. And, and I think they can all, you know, get into, into the groups and, and see how they can work together to, to get those needs, uh, to get out of that situation the best way they can for, for all the groups. So where do you see some examples of that here? For example, uh, the UN Secretary General, the scientist and the architect, they are all part of the, 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 the advice, the, the mentoring, the, the, the people who can join uh, those who are in need and offer them uh, the solution or, or work with them for the solution. Maybe not only offer it, but work with them for, for their own solution and to adapt to their, to their own reality. Um, um, yeah, I think, and I think, for example, Stephanie in Miami. <laughs> yes, yes. Stephanie in Miami, I, I mean, she has two inches of water in her house, but I'm sure that if she knows that there are some refugees that, that have nowhere to, to sleep at night or, or whatever, she will be able to see how her roof is going to be able to, to help them, for example. Mm -hmm. Or I, th I think that it's a common sense of solidarity that triggers in these kinds of situations, even if you are the one in need, you also see that there's someone who needs more than you. And, and I think we all get in, we all jump into uh, the group to help the best way we can. Mm -hmm. Even when we are in need, there could be someone who is in more need. Mm -hmm. What other connections do you see? And we'll take, we can take from anyone who's observing this, connections amongst the different stakeholders here. Going with some of these ideas of people who have something and people who need something. Wait time is a very important part of teaching. <laughs> the very interesting thing that I have just, I've seen a couple of interesting things happen here. I think it's time for me to go ahead and share with you our definition of global learning. And you can tell us, anyone in this group, any of our participants, if you think that we just had a global learning experience and what were the design aspects of, um, of the experience that were or were not global learning related. So here we go. Here we go for the big reveal. Global learning is a process that involves diverse people collaboratively analyzing and addressing complex problems that transcend borders. Your thoughts, do you think that we just had a, a global learning experience and to what extent did we or did we not? Vanessa's, she, Vanessa's nodding her head. What, and what, what came up for you, Vanessa? Yes, because actually, I mean, there is something that probably you said, like, uh, it's a problem only in Miami. I mean, it's, it's, it's their problem. It's, it's not in my country, so it's so far from here. But anyway, the, the situation of the sea level rises means that it's going to affect not only not only United States, but it's going to affect the whole the whole world. So, and probably some people is going to say, well, I, I depend on the United States. So if, if something happens there, it's going to affect me mm -hmm. and so on, so on, so on. So I really like this definition. I didn't know before. So uh, 
could learn. I mean, this is something that I have never seen before because sometimes global learning, you think that yes, of course, it's regarding to collaboration, but you never thought that, uh, that the implications of transcending borders Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not only going to be like in a single, a small place locally, probably, but it's going to transcend to the to the global space. So I think that is is very interesting. Okay, so you uh, found some you found some interest in the fact that this this definition is not so much about what you learn or where you learn, but it's about how you learn, and the process somehow makes connections between what is local and what is global or what is here and what is there and it has implications for seeing borders in a different way does that sound right yeah yeah besides because it's based on a on a learning perspective itself it's like a solving problems so based on that you can you can match it not only with solving problem but as well with project based and etc so in fact you are going to see like a perspective uh, like um a teaching perspective and in that way you can construct like this global learning and, so, and i i know that maria carolina you said you you, you had a hand, hand raised before before I go to you. I just want to call attention to one thing you just said, which was an observation that I had to. When we start to think about a problem like this, and it is a problem, it's a challenge. Usually when we think from our own perspective, we're thinking, oh, this is negative. Like, what? where am I going to find a home? Where am I going to find food? What don't I have? What do I lack? What? What, what am I missing? But as soon as I asked you to make connections, to find relationships, what started to happen? Solutions started to happen. Hmm. But I never said, solve this problem. You began to get into that solution space just by virtue of hearing other people's perspectives. You started to discover the fact that somebody has something that I might not have realized that they need that I have and vice versa. Someone so far away is sharing an emotional experience that I'm having. Someone so far away, I could collaborate and, and make something new that's mutually reinforcing, but I never said solve, I just said connect. So think about, think about keep that in your mind, M Maria. <laughs> No, it was related to what Vanessa said about, um, you know, getting, I mean, it was very interesting to, to see how people who apparently are not connected end up connected by the same, by the same um, issue. Um, I would like to add that maybe uh, from the table, or at least from my perspective, we, I could have asked uh, the, the, the rest of, of the participants um, who, who are not part of the, of the fishbowl. Uh, because sometimes we feel like my job or my situation is somehow connected to what just happened. But maybe I, I ignore uh, just unconsciously that maybe somebody else could be connected or is not connected, but they have an expertise or, or they have something that they can add. Uh, and I'm not asking, you know. So I, I was answering your question and, and thinking it from my perspective, but I, I, I didn't ask somebody else who might be uh, or who might have a good idea uh, around the, the issue. Uh, so I think that that connection was missing from, from, from the exercise, you know, to, to, to ask anybody who, who wants to join, who wants to, to help, you know, not only the people who apparently are connected somehow to, to the problem. Now you see, as a teacher, I'm delighted. My learning outcome was achieved by what you just said, because you realized that it matters, the solution, the equity, the justice, the fairness, the effectiveness of the solution is a function of who is at the table. And when we are missing perspectives, when we have global issues, complex problems that, that impact people differentially, if we don't have their perspective at the table, if we cannot see the world from their mapped perspective, we can't create a solution that will be impactful and effective and, and fair. So I'm delighted that you just said what you just said. <laughs> Sandra. Okay, well, so I've been thinking a lot about what has just happened in here. And basically I think that 
we need to start somewhere. And it is basically where we are, right? Yeah. And if we cannot solve our problems, uh, which are nearby, it's very difficult also to think about something globally. That's why it is very important to like stop thinking that much about ourselves and start developing this, um, I forgot the name, sympathy yeah. uh, with others. Yes. Because if, if we cannot connect with the other, if we just think a lot about the thing that is, that is affecting me a lot, like to me personally, and I cannot look beyond from where I am, it is very difficult to think about global learning because I cannot pretend to be thinking about how to connect with the world if we cannot even have like good relationships around me, right? Mm -hmm. So this exercise helped me a lot to realize that, that we need to start thinking about the others, uh, to think about how the others uh, feel, experience, and actually live their own situations. It's at that point when I can think about um, a global learning process, you know, like yes. how from the little part that I have I can collaborate, I can connect, I can keep in mind other people's perspectives in order not only to solve my problem, but at least to try to give like most of people uh, like somehow a solution for what they are experiencing at that point. Do you feel that the, the fact that I challenged you to step out of your own perspective and have an imaginative, through the role play, that that helped you to do that a little bit? Yeah, definitely, yeah. because it's the same thing. Uh, if I am all the time thinking, for example, about a mother, I'm going to focus all my attention on my children, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm a teacher, I'm going to be thinking about the curriculum, for example. And there are many other things beyond, as we just were challenged today. So that's a good way to give a global perspective to every topic we're teaching every day in our class. Yeah. So, so far, some of the design aspects that you all have said made a big difference for you was the fact that there was the, the, the request to analyze the issue from different perspectives and also to get out of our own perspective, the challenge to think through the eyes of another or to go through what uh, the process of transpection. Yeah. So to, to see the world from another's perspective, to, to, enter into, when we think of perspective, we generally think of what we see above the waterline. If we're imagining that perspective is like, uh, uh, a, um, like an iceberg, this, then what we see above the water are people's behaviors and their opinions. And we think, oh, that's their perspective. People who are Democrats think this way. People who are Republicans think this way. People who are from Colombia think this way. No. Our perspective is what we can't see. And there's a writer named Robert Hanvey who said it in a very poetic way. Our perspective are, is a function of our ordinarily unexamined assumptions about time, about space, about causality. Vanessa, you said when you came into this space, it's almost like you had an assumption that, oh, this is a, this is a problem for them. But when you were asked to get into another person's perspective and to put on another sense of glass, you started to assume make different assumptions about the world and you realize, wow, when you went back into your home perspective, I just had, it's almost like a study abroad, <laughs> right? You just studied abroad without leaving your own body or in your own home. <laughs> you went into another mindset and through that activity of connecting another person's perspective with your own, connecting the different roles, the I, different ideas, you had a transformational experience of producing new knowledge, producing solutions. Any other thoughts before we continue? Because I want to take us into the space of global citizenship. Matias, yes. Yeah, as I am co-host, I cannot raise my hand. I cannot <laughs> say, oh, so I am limited in certain tools. 
but we have a mixture of, of people in here, academics, professors, researchers, and different people. And, uh, and what I see here that resonates with everybody is the fact of problem solving, critical thinking, but also the fact of interdependence. You know, like uh, we live in an interdependent world. It's not independent or dependent. You know, we are interdependent. This causality that you were just mentioning. And, uh, and what we want to do is really like to try to address those complex problems. This morning was, uh, one of the questions was, so what? That was one of exactly. the remarks, so what? So how can I relate to that? And when we are talking about a uh, global learning and global citizenship, uh, many times we think of it as an abstract topic, mm -hmm. which, you know, and, uh, and when we take these kind of approaches, even in, in our local realities, when we take somebody's or, or some people's different perspectives, we know that we have uh, probably so much, probably we don't know deeply, but we can relate to people's roles and how they can actually collaborate. And that, so it's, it's very interesting to think outside the box because I think that was the exercise that we had in here to think outside the box, especially because it was not our, our it was not close to our own reality, but it helped us also like to be in somebody else's shoes in order to to think about solutions, which was natural, as you said, you didn't ask us to do that. And that's I did okay. not ask you. It was the, it's like magic, right? But it doesn't happen by default. It happens by design. It doesn't happen just because we have students who are from all over the world in our online or in our face-to-face -face classroom, and they're listening to a professor lecture to us about a topic that is very complex and global. That's not how global learning happens. Yes, it does involve all the ingredients that are in the classroom, but they have to be designed in a special way to get to this transformation. And it can happen online, it can happen in person, in the community, it can happen through study abroad. And that means that we want to design the space so that we are bringing diverse perspectives together. And as the professor or the researcher, or the staff member, when we're trying to solve an institutional problem, we want to think who needs to be at the table to go where Maria was, what, what, was saying. Who is, the, who is usually marginalized? Whose voice is not heard? And you only need one person who thinks differently to make the whole group say, hmm. So we want to bring diversity to the space. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second then we have to have a complex problem. If we don't have a complex problem that one group or perspective can, cannot solve, then you don't really need global learning, <laughs> right? We have to have some kind of a complex problem. And the last one is the collaboration. We need individuals to think from their own perspectives, but then to bring them together to make connections. So let's think about, let's connect this to global citizenship. And most people in this group said that global citizenship is something that happens through education. And it was a, this was a topic that came up in this morning's conversation. Both gen, and I thought of these questions days ago, but these were the themes that came up. Both professors were saying, well, yes, we're all born citizens of the world. We're, we live on this planet. We are deeply interconnected. Our well-being is, is interconnected. But you have said today that it doesn't just happen by default because you're born that you develop this global mindset or the knowledge and the skills and the attitudes, the empathetic understanding, to use what Sandra said, to, to work with others and to to see the world in this complex way. And the other topic that happened today, or the other co um, comment that was made this morning is, yes, it happens in the classroom, but it also happens outside of the classroom. This is a holistic, this is our whole lives that go into the making of a global citizenship, citizen. And so what does that look like? At FIU, and I'm just gonna give you my perspective, we came to the same conclusion as they did at PISA, which is we have many different, we can engage in a conversation about who is a global citizen and you're gonna pick someone and I'm gonna pick somebody else. But when it comes right down to it, a global citizen needs to have an understanding of the world's complexity and interrelatedness. 
And I hope that that came out of this experience that we just had. We just saw the world's complexity. If, if I had pushed you and we had a little bit more time, we would have had lines going everywhere. When I do this with faculty, students, people, it's just like a mess. That's what you want. We wanna see the complexity. As Matias said, this has got to stop being so abstract. We need to be able to tell teachers, how do you do this in your classroom? How do you make these abstract ideas of interrelatedness and global complexity something students can see? Yeah. And also, they need to have that global perspective, the ability to create a multi perspective understanding of an issue. I'm not going to go back, it'll take too much time, but when we look at the map, you can see the different perspectives. And as we were saying earlier, you can't have a global perspective all by yourself. This is a function of the group. We need to invite people to reveal their perspectives. Otherwise, we can't have a global perspective. We have to reach out. And finally, a willingness to engage with diverse others in this type of problem solving. And that's where education, I think, really comes in because we can guide people through the reflection process of how hard it is to do this work and help students get trained and for, for learning different languages and how do, you, um, how do you read body language and what are different collaborative uh, processes to bring to an intercultural and an interdisciplinary space. Researchers can teach students these, these practices. This is what we do in higher education. And when you put all of these things together, that's global citizenship. We don't want to teach our students or tell our students how to act as global citizens. We want to develop their global awareness, perspective, and engagement, and then let them choose how they will live their lives as global citizens, making music, making science. So now, we go one step further. So we've been really talking about what is that relationship between the teacher and the student mostly in global learning. And then we started to talk about global citizenship, but the entire institution is about internationalization. Yeah. And I, and this is, this is where the, the real, the real, power of this comes in and brings in the layer that Matthias was saying we have in this space researchers and administrators. So what does this have to do with me? Yeah. So that was where my question was. Is internationalization something we just do inward? Can we put a sign above the door where Florida International University and all of a sudden we're internationalized? <laughs> Can we say, oh, we send 10% of our students abroad. We're internationalized. Oh, we have partnerships with the highest ranked institutions around the world. We're internationalized. We have faculty who speak different languages. We have courses in the area of studies. We're internationalized. No, mm. it is something that's inward, but it's also something that's outward. And it's outward in the sense that we're part of a global, knowledge exchange and production network. The problems that we seek to understand and solve are bigger than our institution can do by itself. And so this is my favorite, favorite <laughs> definition of internationalization, is that it is a process just like global learning about connecting the institution and the people within it with the world's knowledge exchange and production network. To me, it's like my whole university or college has become a global learning machine, <laughs> right? We're always connecting with diverse others. We're always realizing that there's something not only that we're missing, but there's something we need to contribute. 
other universities, other countries, other cities, other people need what we know, no matter what, no matter what the demographic or complexion or where we are. We can be the smallest institution in the tiniest town far away from the cities and someone in the world needs to know what we know. And so it's an outward connection. Just like Carolina Maria was saying, there's always someone who needs what we have. Someone who needs what we have. So when we hear people say internationalization needs to be a win-win, it's not about win-win like we get the knowledge and you get the money. That's win-win. But that's not what this is. Win-win is you need the knowledge and skills and, and perspectives that I have, and I need what you have. <laughs> and together, we're going to produce new knowledge. And that looks really different in different classes and with different researchers. So I want to give you a couple of examples, very concrete examples. So in the upper left-hand corner, this is a class in history and the students do a role play called reacting to the past but it's for our international students our international students are playing the roles just like hamilton <laughs> of the of the 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 revolutionary leaders and it's this mix of different perspectives these connection of different national and cultural gender perspectives and looking at history through the prism of those perspectives and the prism of the now, that it changes the way we see the past and it changes the way we see the future. And it changes the way we see ourselves. So in this course, the global learning problem is whose story is being told, whose story is left out of history and why. In the next, in the, on the right, there's the image of the robot and the hand we have in engineering, usually we teach our engineers to draw boundaries around problems. Okay, you need, we say, all right, build a bridge. It's a good bridge if it stands. Well, but if nobody uses the bridge because it's, uh, because it's built on uh, an indigenous sacred place, or if the bridge falls apart, because nobody, the engineers were from another country and they had no idea about the weather and the, and the kinds of materials you should use in that country. So we want to have interdisciplinarity. The question is what makes a good bridge? What makes a bridge really work for people? So we want to connect science and the humanities, science and the social sciences. And down on the on the lower left hand corner, that's an image from a class that's in uh, biology. It's a, it's a, uh, they use a coil. This is pure science and the global learning problem that they're thinking about, this is, it's an, actually it's an epidemiology course, excuse me, is they're asking who has access to the research? questions about open access to data. And so they're using maps to try to figure out where, how, where are citations being made of really important, uh, uh, really important studies and where are people not having access to information that they need. And this is in the pure sciences. And down at the bottom, that's a picture of our photo voice class. So this is a class where students do study abroad for a short period of time and they're put they're using that methodology they put cameras into the hands of people who are hiv positive and homeless in santo domingo and who are also iv drug users and these are students who want to go into medicine and public health and they need to understand the direct day-to-day -day experience of their patients in a way that they will never get that information by asking questions they need to put that camera into the hands of the people who are suffering that they want to help. 
So in every one of these activities, every one of these formations, we want to create the diversity bonus. The idea of super additivity of diversity. I have an idea and you have a slightly different idea. We put together parts of our different ideas and we come up with a third idea. That's the production of new knowledge. And that is the mission of higher education. And that's what global learning is all about. The exchange and production of new knowledge. And we have been doing connection, connection making since humans came to be. <laughs> we look up at the stars and we look for patterns. We see chaos and we start looking for animals. We've been connecting, we do it naturally. But if we do not connect and if we do not start thinking differently, the world will not change. <laughs> it will remain the same. And so that, to me, and I hope now in some sense for you, is a relationship between global learning, internationalization, and what global citizenship is all about. Whew. <laughs> That's a lot. That is, what I, that is what I have for you today. And if you want to talk a little bit more, we can. I would love to. We have maybe six minutes. I also want to let you know that if you want to talk more deeply about things, I invite that. I would love to do that with you. And you can connect with me in a lot of different ways. And I will say that it's a crazy connecting time, as you know. But if you write me or call me, <laughs> I will write or call back. Sometimes it takes a few days. But I will respond. <sighs> Any thoughts that you want to share, even right now? <laughs> Sandra, Sandra has raised her hand, yeah. Well, I think that my conclusion, uh, like my very personal conclusion, it's about questions. The type of questions we ask ourselves really matter because they can lead us towards the goal we want to achieve or they can just take us very far from what we want. And in this case, the type of questions, the, the, I'm sorry, the type of questions we ask ourselves can give us a very wider perspective out of our comfort zone, and they can basically end up in what you just finished with, which I totally agree with. Uh, and it is the opportunity to create, right? When I have one idea and another person has another idea, that third idea usually grows much bigger than we expected in the very beginning. So to me, that's like my personal conclusion. I hope that you will write about that. Like, you know, I, there are some great, um, I'm not as familiar with the different journals and magazines and the different ways to get our ideas out in Latin America as I am, say, EAIE has something called the Winter Forum. There's the University World News. There's, I, hope that you will write about that idea about questions and their relationship to creating new knowledge because that's the sort of thing that teachers and researchers, student leaders, internationalization leaders, that's what we need. We need a lot more, and especially in Spanish, <laughs> we need a lot more writing about how to think about this in very concrete ways. So if you have thoughts about like how to format questions, that would be I would love to read that. <laughs> That'd be so good. <laughs> Any other thoughts we would like to share while we're here today? Or any questions about our initiative? Lisbeth. Afternoon, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the workshop. That is the first thing that I want to say. I really enjoy it. It was very uh, useful and it was very inspirational, let's say. Uh, I am an English teacher in Bogota and I could really like to apply these activities with my students. Um, I, I, I just want to comment that I am... Um, 
let's say, this kind of activities that are related to global learning um, have a lot of advantages, but I see one that is very important and is that we can foster the investigation process of our students using this kind of activities too, right? Mm -hmm. Because as they are assuming different roles, um, maybe they are not going to have all the knowledge or all the expertise as one of the people were saying there, right? Uh, to be able to, to contribute to solve the problems, right? So they should investigate more about the problem and about the roles that maybe they can have in the activity. So I really like it and I see a very big opportunity for my students to improve their investigation process through this. I love it. I'm so glad that you said that, Elizabeth. That's why I said at the beginning that people get extra credit for questions. Yeah, you, we can, you can use this activity to generate research questions. You can use it as an assessment. You can have students do one of these maps at the beginning of a class and then after they have done more reading and more thinking, come back and make another map. There's, you can have students then take the map that they create uh, together and then do re writing and research of each of the different perspectives. They can put things together into a model or uh, a letter to, the edit to an editor of a newspaper or a new law. There's so many different ways to use this kind of activity. And I think it was Vanessa was saying earlier, from good teaching and learning, project-based learning, there are lots of different ways to do this kind of learning. We just, use it for global learning. And I think we have maybe time for one more, like one minute, one more um, comment. Vanessa, did you want to say something? Well, I have a question or more a concern. It's regarding to a cultural perspective in my country that sometimes people relate like this global awareness uh, only when you travel or when you have any experience of mobility or when you are um, a migrant. So in that perspective, how can we start um, like, uh, I don't know if teaching or making people aware of that is not mandatory to travel or to have this kind of experiences to be, uh, to be open-minded for the world for this kind of situations. I mean, like uh, this, this, this network. I will try to answer this quickly. First of all, in an institution, it is a long-term process. We have to start with our early innovators and early adopters. I write a lot about this in, in the fifth chapter of, of the book that I shared. And then, and then we move to ever increasing uh, groups of people. But we have found that the only way to do this is through experiences. We have to bring faculty into a workshop where they do this thing. And then they say, oh, now I get it. And, and it makes all of the difference. I think, I don't remember who it was in the group, maybe it was you, who said, when I get out of my perspective into someone else's perspectives, that's the chance when I can change my own perspective. And so what's happening here is we're getting the teacher into the learner's perspective and they experience the global learning shift. And then they say, all right, I'm in, I can do this. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we deeply appreciate your presentation. We thank you all for your active participation. The commentaries are quite positive and inspiring. Thank you all. And uh, where now we go in 30 minutes for visitors, like for visiting the exhibitors virtual stands. And in 30 minutes, we will start our new session. So thank you so much. We hope that you continue enjoying lunch. Thank you so much for being thank part you, of this. Stephanie. Very brave. <laughs> thank you. Ciao. <laughs>